The people you're trying to protect, they are not coming for you. The only person that can save you now, Leia, is you. You are gonna tell me what I wanna know. What are you doing to The me? same thing I do to anyone who doesn't embrace the Empire. I think I've just found out what they're hiding down here. This place isn't a fortress. It's a tomb. Wait! I got you, Sully. Just go! Wait, leave her. Come on. Right, come on, boy. Destroy them. All right, right behind you. Wait. Where's Wade? Guess you're soldiers now, after all. Welcome to A Conspiracy in the Force, the show where we examine parallel conspiracies in a galaxy far, far away, in a galaxy not so far away. The show is designed as an introduction to modern day conspiracy theories by using Star Wars, one of the most beloved fictional universes, as a point of reference. Let's begin. This episode is titled, Obi-Wan, number four, 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 four. On today's episode, we will be discussing episode four of the Obi-Wan Kenobi series, and we are now over halfway done with the six-episode season. This was the shortest episode by far, with a runtime of 38 minutes long. But still, there's much to discuss. This episode was yet again another Young Princess Leia Rescue episode, which mirrored the events of Episode 2. But this also largely paralleled the events in the original Star Wars film, where you had the rescue of adult Princess Leia from the Death Star. In certain details were direct parallels, such as the fact that they were let go from this prison without being killed because a tracking device was planted on them. In this episode, it starts out with Obi-Wan in a Bacta tank, which has been a frequently used trope going back to the Boba Fett series, in which he would experience dreams and memories while engulfed in the healing Bacta elements. In this, however, Obi-Wan experiences nightmares and recurring visions of his most recent defeat at the hands of Vader. Now I looked up some more information about Bacta, because the only time we saw this being used in the films was in The Empire Strikes Back, after Luke was attacked by the Wampa and was suffering extreme hypothermia. We saw him in there only for a matter of seconds on screen, and then he came out. So how come in this new era of Star Wars does the Bacta tank seem to produce dreams, nightmares, and allow for memory recall? Per the Star Wars Encyclopedia Wikipedia, here's some more information about the Bacta liquid itself in the current canon of Star Wars facts. Quote, Most Bacta patients felt as if they were being swallowed alive upon being submerged in the substance. As such, most doctors injected sedatives first, while subsequent waves of relaxation would slowly overcome the patient, sending them into a meditative state. While most retained consciousness, the combination of drugs and Bacta commonly led patients to feeling like they were drifting into another world. End quote. So it appears that this representation of the mental state of the characters in the Bacta tanks is on par with the Bacta in other non-visual mediums in Star Wars. In this episode, it does appear that Obi-Wan is really getting his mojo back, as he is back to his old fighting style and ways from the prequel era. However, it does seem a bit sudden after his near-death experience in the prior episode. 
he didn't seem to have many negative effects from that, from that. This episode also featured a common trope of recent Star Wars storytelling, which is the child in danger trope. In this episode, it was fairly brutal, with 10-year-old Leia being put in a torture rack by Reva because she wouldn't divulge her knowledge of rebel activities, which she literally didn't know about anyways. Reva tried to play nice with her and gain her trust, but when Leia wouldn't give her what she wanted, she started the torture. She said that she would do to Leia what was done to anyone that didn't obey the Empire. And isn't that just a perfect analogy for the useful idiots promoting our current government agendas today? They stand for equality, for human rights, and for loving everybody. But the second you don't fall in line with their demands or agree with them on the narratives they're pushing, they fly off the handle. 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 We also see a young Jedi child who was killed and was being displayed in a grotesque tomb at the bottom of the Inquisitor's base, along with many other Jedi. Obi-Wan came across this and was aghast. There were many Jedi that appeared dead, floating in some sort of liquid. Was it Bacta or was it something else? We don't know. They seemed to be in suspended animation or something. The inference I made here is that these Jedi were captured and killed by the Inquisitors and were being preserved so that their Jedi DNA could be harvested and manipulated for nefarious purposes. If you recall in the Mandalorian series, the Empire was using blood extractions from Baby Yoda to perform some sort of experiment, possibly to create super soldiers. And in Chapter 12 of that series, the main characters even came across several life forms in a similar state as the Jedi seen in this episode. Now we do also know that the Emperor himself had many contingency plans to keep the Empire in power if he would die, or to preserve his own life force, per the convoluted story surrounding his survival and rebirth in the sequel trilogy, which I still really don't understand or even believe. 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 Something else from this episode that I wanted to discuss is something that's becoming a bit of a meme in the Star Wars fan community, and it's the death of the character Wade, one of the most non-Star Wars names I've ever heard. As Obi-Wan and Leia are being rescued from the Inquisitor's prison, a rebel pilot named Wade is shot down and killed. The other rebels are really distraught about this death, and there are some emotional moments we see on screen. But we as an audience didn't really know this character at all, nor did we know what his significance was to the rebel cell and its operations. He was only on the screen for a matter of seconds. So we didn't have the same emotional response. But this sacrifice does symbolize something that happens all the time in our world. A random person dies doing something heroic. In this case, Wade wasn't even really a fighter. He had just decided to help them, to adapt their vehicles into fighting vehicles to help save the day. And although he did do something heroic, he wouldn't get a hero's burial. He was just shot down in the sea and would rot there. It brings to mind all the soldiers over the years dying on battlefields all around the world and never having their bodies come back home, or maybe even dying in enemy captivity. Or even back in biblical times, many of Jesus' disciples were tortured and killed for following his teachings. Their bodies didn't get a traditional Jewish burial. They were burned, torn asunder, and mutilated, but their stories lived on in perpetuity. Now Wade, while a largely unknown character, he will have his sacrifice be meaningful into the future of the Rebellion, whether he knew it or not, as he saved Obi-Wan, who would help train Luke, and he also helped save Leia, who would be a strong political leader in general for both the Rebellion and the New Republic. Republic. Now, two more points I wanted to touch on. When Reva was trying to win Leia's trust and coerce her into giving up information about the rebellion, she tells her that no one is coming for you. Now, this is familiar because this line was said by Leia's previous captors at the end of the first episode. Although this time, Reva adds a qualifier. She says that the only one that can save you is you. Now, what she meant was that by giving the information she had, she could be set free. But I think this has a deeper meaning. Many people in our world, and even in this conspiracy truth community, 
believe that there is no biblical God, that that's a false manipulation of some sort, and that we ourselves are a God. God is within us inherently, and we are our own savior and spiritual entity. Basically, we do not have to submit to a higher power, because we are the higher power. Now, obviously, I'm sure if you've noticed, I do not hold to this ideal. I hold to the truth of the biblical Godhead Trinity, where God is the intelligent designer and creator of us in this world, sent his son to die for our sins, and gave those who believe in him the Holy Spirit to help guide and shape their lives. So for what I believe, we cannot save ourselves. Only God can do that. He will come for us if we let him in, and he will save us, save us, save us. Now finally, I have a little bit of a theory about Vader, Riva, and the Grand Inquisitor. Now this isn't a theory I wholly fleshed out on my own. It's something I heard pieces of mentioned on my favorite Star Wars podcast, Rebel Force Radio, which is actually the only pure Star Wars podcast I listen to, so go check it out. Anyways, the theory goes that the Grand Inquisitor is not really dead, as we were led to believe at the end of Episode 2, at the hands of Riva and her lightsaber. This is due to the fact that the Grand Inquisitor himself is in the Star Wars Rebels animated series, which takes place several years after the events of the show. So the theory states that somehow Vader knew the Inquisitor was not dead, or maybe Vader himself even helped to bring him back to life, in a similar fashion to how he was brought back to life using cybernetics and whatnot. The theory continues that Vader is really just manipulating Reva to bring Kenobi to him, as he is reeling her in with the idea that she can become the Grand Inquisitor if she does all the things he asks her. Little does she know, she will just be a useful idiot doing his bidding, and then he will kill her off. No different than Palpatine did to the Trade Federation leaders in the prequels. It would also parallel how Palpatine manipulated Anakin to destroy the Jedi for him, and then he would help save Padme. But in the end, Padme died anyways, and Anakin didn't get what he wanted. He may be petty enough or evil enough to want to enact the same fate on someone else. So we shall see. 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 So that's the episode for today. I hope you enjoyed it and are enjoying this Obi-Wan Kenobi series. I will say that the series must be somewhat good. Because my wife, who hated the Ewan McGregor Obi-Wan character in the prequel trilogy, actually enjoys this show. So there's that. So some notes about what's coming up this week on Conspiracy in the Force. I'll be dropping the audio of a conversation I had a few weeks ago with the Fire Theft Radio crew on Wednesday. And then Thursday night, I'll be doing a live show on Twitter, Rockfin, and YouTube with the man, the myth, the best, Mr. Charlie Robinson, author and host of the amazing Macroaggressions podcast. We'll, of course, be talking about all the lunacy of this world and where we're going from here. Again, that's a live show Thursday night. And the audio of that chat will be dropped in the podcast feeds on Friday. So stay tuned for all the fun this week. And then a week from today, I'll be back with a breakdown of Kenobi, Episode 5. Have a happy Monday. May the Force be with you. And God bless. Bless.